uh, we can keep it offline as well and disconnect a bit. Laurel, I had to open it up. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone. I'm just going to do a quick introduction of uh, what Product Stories is. Um, but first, who's been to a Product Stories before? This is our sixth. Sweet. Uh, cool. It's become every, every meetup, it's uh, more and more people, so that's nice. Uh, but for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, the idea behind Product Stories is to gather people from the startup ecosystem around everything that has to do with products. So it can be marketing, it can be growth, it can be data, and it can be obviously uh, product market fit for today. So um, we also want it to be very collaborative. So please, every time you have questions or comments, just raise your hand and we'll happily uh, have you jump into the conversation. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the main thing. It's organized by myself, um, Arno, and Toma, who's uh, the one who probably just uh, saw it, uh, uh, I kill you. <laughs> the entrance. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Laura. Well. Welcome uh, to our three guests tonight. So we have Arthur from uh, Job Teaser, we have Maya from Aircall, and we have Guillaume from Bearer. Do you know any of those guys, any of the company, as you read, if you know them already? Cool. Sweet. So welcome to them, a uh, big round of applause, I think. Uh... <laughs> you have to withdraw that applause at the end if it was good. <laughs> All right, uh, to get started, I think we, so my name is Arnaud, I'm uh, co-organizing the meetup. I'm working at Screen, we are doing uh, web security, I'm leading the product there. So product has been a, a strong focus for me for the past year and a half, and so product storage is also a source of learning for me. I mean, uh, what they're going to share tonight is also things I want to learn from. And so I choose this topic because it's a hot topic for me. So yeah, everything they're going to say tonight is a source of uh, learning for me. Um, from the, just a quick uh, last poll, I think on Twitter, I did a quick polling and you guys were most interested by how do we find that product market fit? Can you raise your hand if it's your main interest tonight? All right, we also plan to talk about what it takes to be a product manager in a startup looking for their market fit. Can you raise your hand if that's your main interest tonight? All right, and is there, if you have any other interest, just raise your hand and uh, you will be able to voice it out uh, during the question. So as Laure said, we're gonna take a round of questions regularly, like every 10 or 15 minutes. So feel free to raise your hand, Laure will batch it and pass the mic uh, when we uh, we, we do a, a break. Um, maybe to get started, Arthur, I think you wanted to introduce us a bit more about what's the product market fit. I think it's a, uh, not everything, everyone is, everyone has its own definition, everyone is, uh, has a different perspective on it, so we just wanted to start with a quick uh, alignment on that. Uh, thank you, Arno, and thanks for having me. As you can see, my voice is a bit cut. I was a bit ambitious with the sun that was out there, so I go out like, uh, Again, in the, in the summer, I was expecting that for too long. So if you cannot uh, understand what I say, just hear it, and I will try to, to speak louder. Uh, so, uh, product market fit for me uh, is a big word, is a big concept for something that is very basic. Uh, it means that is uh, are the users interested enough in your product? Are they, do they find it useful enough? A set of users find it useful enough? Being very vague, uh, as Arnaud just said, it means that there is no like kind of unified definition of it. I think it's Mark Andreessen that uh, first came with the concept like uh, maybe seven years ago, and that just said you feel product market fit. You feel when you have it, and you feel when you don't have it. So it's pretty esoteric. Uh, since then, there has been a more objectified definition with, I think, uh, B2C1, uh, coined uh, by the guy that done the link canva that said uh, if 40 percent of your users say they would be very disappointed that you stop doing your product you have a product market fit some other guys say well in b2b if you have five ambassadors it means you have a product market fit there are a lot of definitions i think it's uh, to objectify that vague notion and what will be maybe very interest, uh, interesting tonight is that it's not just a concept for early stage startups. 
I think when uh, Arno uh, called me uh, to say if uh, I want to be interested in talking in that meetup, he said, but you are a big startup uh, that is already scaling, you had uh, 200 people, a uh, market fit and so on, but uh, one market fit is not enough and we will be able to develop that. I see uh, the product strategy as a sequence of market fits. And when you think about that big companies, that's what they have done, that's what we try to do too. So there will be two different topics, I think, early stage one and late stage companies. Cool, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Maria, I'm um, Actually, I'm no longer at Airco. Uh, I decided to leave to build my, uh, my own thing. I'll tell you a bit more about it later. But I worked at Airco for a while, um, and I'm going to tell you about how we reached um, several, or didn't reach several market fits. Um, do you want to go over that, or should yeah, I? Yeah, sure. Do I mean, after you want to cover your slide? Oh, you can get back to Okay. Um, so I think that the, Sorry. Yeah. So product market fit from me is how you adapt your product to your market, very basic. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about that tonight, but there was one thing I wanted to, uh, to cover first, is that very often we talk about product and market, but we miss two very important elements that are the channel and the model. This is a, a concept that has been coined by a guy named uh, Brian Balfour, he's super smart, you should check him out. Uh, but basically this guy says that you should also try to aim for your product model fit and your product channel fit. Uh, so I'll cover that a bit more uh, and give you examples also of how we adapted our product, our channel and our model to our different markets. Uh, so that's the introduction for me. Do you have something to add? Just a quick one. Uh, so well, I'm Guillaume, I'm the co-founder of Bear. So this is an early stage startup, which is interesting. So I'm here as like a CEO, which is usually the first product person in the company, or should be, uh, depending on how you see it. Um, and I've achieved product market fit, or tried to achieve product market fit before in, in previous venture. Um, and it's interesting to see how all that world evolved. Uh, I started that over 10 years ago at a previous company. Um, and there is process now, there is like a lot of Documentation, there is a lot of articles uh, that they mention, and it's, uh, it's well structured, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, and as of today, well, I'm in the middle of it, in the middle of the customer discovery. It's interesting to do that uh, kind of that ping pong in the discussion with, with you guys with that work actually at companies that achieve it. I guess even if you <coughs> get it once and it's forever, this is something that you always need to continuously uh, make sure that you get. So that's that's how we're going to probably to. Uh, to Discuss that, and this is my contribution to the discussion with not being a product person. Awesome. Also, we can uh, give a, a quick round of applause to Vid Racing, who's hosting us tonight. Vid Racing, <laughs> Trust me on that one, finding a place where we can ask so many people, and I'm not bragging about the number of people we are tonight, but just finding that place wasn't easy. So, big thanks to them for hosting. Uh, David has done a tremendous job here to put everything together and make sure it's every, I did nothing basically. So it's all on David, so big thanks uh, to, to you. Uh, so yeah, let's get started with the first uh, theme, the first topic. Yeah, finding the product market fits. I think most of you tonight are here to find that. Uh, I'm sorry if I disappoint you, there's no silver bullet, there's no secret recipe that you're gonna learn tonight. It just a lot of iteration, a lot of experiments, a lot of patience, uh, a lot of strategy, thinking long term, making quick wins. And so what those guys are going to share tonight is their journey finding one or multiple market fits and hopefully you can get away with some actionable things uh, in your own uh, companies. Maybe just so we understand to start, can you just briefly uh, explain us what's the current stage of your team, how much are you in product engineering, uh, what's the current challenges, like just a quick overview so we understand where you guys stand at right now. Sure, um, so Aircall is about 150 people uh, in Paris and in New York, uh, so I joined when we were about 15, so that's a lot more today. Um, and I basically grew, uh, built the product team, that was the first one. Uh, so we have today uh, 7 PMs, I think, three product designers in the team. 
Um, and then in terms of engineering team today, there are about 50 developers with the specificity that some of them are in New York, as I said, so we also have two PMs that are in New York, otherwise it wouldn't be fun, you know. So that's another challenge to, to cover. Uh, on my side, it's pretty similar. So I joined John Teaser eight months ago, so we are a big team of 200 people now. So I have the chance to lead a big product by department, we are 20. So there are five PMs, just uh, the same kind of numbers that Maya, we also have a big design department. And what is very interesting uh, for product market fit, we have a big design department, which is really focused on user research and user exper experience. And we will cover that later, but I think that's uh, those uh, critical resources because the discovery is uh, maybe the, the most important part of the product. Uh, management when you are looking for product market fits. So those guys uh, are the ones who help us a lot with product manager on uh, finding market fits. Yeah, we take a question like in, yeah, Laura, you, yeah, Jacob has a question for later. Uh, for later. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. It would be really useful if you just quickly gave us an introduction into what it is your company does. Right now? Yeah. Sure, you don't know air cool and job teaser? Come on. <laughs> well, where are you living for the past year? <laughs> well, it's easy for me. You don't know my company, which is obvious. We started a year ago. It's called Bear. Uh, basically, we're helping developers and, and, and SaaS vendors, so developers, the solution engineers, through product people, scale their integration strategy. We live basically in a world where you sponsor software and yourself as you're doing the software, you need to connect to the world. Uh, you need to be integrated, you need to integrate yourself into other software. And basically, everything relies on APIs. We've been working on APIs for the past 10 years. We kind of know what APIs are and how to build them today. But it's still a struggle to actually build something meaningful at, uh, at an interesting cost, I'd say, and to maintain it over time. So we're building a technology to help you scale those integration that actually comes on top of API. And one of the goals and the, and this probably the bullish thing is to say we want to standardize integration uh, in, a, in a world that is actually not standardized at all. Um, and just previously, my previous company was actually on the on the ed tech market, and I managed the entire engineering staff of a company called Skillsoft, which is one of the oldest SaaS vendors uh, in that market, which is a 3,000 employee company. And just to relate to the number of people, there are like 50 people in the company. Uh, so that's that's also a different scale, and with like six different regions in the world. Uh, so that was a huge mess. Uh, so I can relate to how we deal with that at, at a different scale. Uh, so Aircall is a phone system for businesses. Uh, and so what's interesting about a phone system is that basically every business needs it. And so that's why it was a big, you know, not a pain, but it was complicated to find product market fit because we wanted to choose the right market. So I'll tell you more. But uh, yeah, it's a very, very wide product. So on Jump Teaser, we are the career coach for students. So we are their official tools when they are in schools. We have more than 400 universities that have Jump Teaser as the career tool of the students across all Europe. Basically, so that's the first market fit, uh, market, market fit we had to find is with the university. Our business model is a bit uh, original because it involves three parts. Basically, it's free for schools. So they have a whole platform to deal with career coaches and career services. And we finance it uh, by having the companies paying to diffuse like offers, uh, mark employer, and different content on the platforms. So if you want to reach any student in Europe today, the only way to do it is through job teaser, basically, because we are in the universities and it's uh, almost uh, a monopoly. To say. So we are very lucky to have that. Awesome. Can, can you, uh, just because that's very clear from every one of your pitch, that you guys have this market fit because you are able to pitch it in a very direct way. Like, we are doing this for those, boom. There's no like, yeah, we're doing that, but also we want to do that, and maybe we will do that at some point, which is typically the exploration phase. Maybe you can can explain us quickly the timeline of market fit, maybe, uh, and for you, Guillaume, maybe more, where do you see that first market fit happening, and why do you feel it? 
um, just to start in a quick way on this, I think uh, job teaser is a pretty interesting case because they uh, lived like uh, almost five years with a weak market fit. So they don't like when I say that, it's recorded, I'm sorry. But they tried uh, to do Welcome to the Jungle like 10 years before and without having really the, the media and the kind of journalistic uh, aspect of it. So it didn't really take off. At first it was just uh, giving information to the students through video content. Okay? And it's five years after that when uh, the ESSEC business school, and as uh, some of you have know, just said, well, it's cool with your videos, but can't you just replace our fucking old job boards with cheese ugly as hell? All students hate it, and we have a career platform that is so ugly. So they say, yes, why not? They did that for free. They found the business model, and then it was a tremendous market fit. It was like the company went from uh, about 30 people to 200 uh, in a matter of a few years, so we doubled the size last year, so it was really a big product market fit quest, I think, that lasted almost six years, so they, uh, they were very courageous, so don't give up, guys, and it's all, uh, today an amazing campaign. Thank you. Um, so I think for us, as I was saying, the important part was choosing the market that you wanted to go for uh, first. Um, so the mission has always been quite the same. There hasn't been a pivot in that uh, specific context. But when I joined uh, three years ago, Ercole er had a fit for very small businesses. So we're a SaaS, uh, so we sell um, per user. Um, and so it was two, three users. Uh, like if we had an account with 10 users, it was a top VIP uh, account. And so at that, time we wanted to go up market with a higher ARPA uh, for our customers and so this was the first time where we really needed to make a decision. We had companies using us for their support team, for their sales team, uh, very small teams obviously, uh, marketing, hiring or just basic phone calls needed for, for anything and so we needed to pick which ones of these markets we wanted to tackle first and we picked support and we really worked uh, for a full year on building those support features and making sure we have a solid value proposition for these guys. And so to answer the first question, I think reaching that second market fit, if I can say, took us about a year. Uh, and we could see at the end of that year that we had clients with 20, 30 users in a support team that were using our product, happy with it, happy with the features uh, and the numbers could tell us that we did a good job there. And then, actually in 2018, we changed again and went to another market. We didn't abandon the other ones, but we decided to expand. Was it intended to have this, were you targeting that first audience, you said, or it happened that that's where people found value in your product, or was it really uh, targeted? You mean choosing support? Yeah. It was very much intentional, yeah. Yeah, we had, several scenarios uh, and we decided to go for this one and it also made sense um, for various reasons that I won't enumerate but yet it was a choice. Cool. Okay, Maya. Uh, so for there currently we are like in the customer discovery stage to be honest. Uh, we spent tons of time doing my R and D and now we've got the basis of the product to actually find actually what is exactly the market and also what is exactly the product because there is two world in product market too. Uh, and, and what's interesting is like I think it's going to take us time, to be honest. Uh, in the developer tool space, it takes all this time. Uh, you probably know like companies like Docker and so on, it always takes a lot of time uh, because the, the market is complex, uh, the technology is complex also. Um, but, but that's actually well known and this is why you need to actually have amazing investors that actually understand that and that they give you enough money to have enough time to find that, uh, that fit. Uh, in my previous company, which is what is interesting, is like when I said that the product market fit, there is product and market. Uh, we nailed the product almost right away, uh, but not the market. And we tried probably every possible market combination ever. Uh, as we started as a B2C company and ended up gradually from being only a Fortune 500 company for the kind of customer we are serving. And we tried everything along the way. We absolutely didn't want to go that way. We didn't want to sell 1,500, 
But at the end of the day, five years later, so I can relate also to job teaser and, and the time needed to actually find it. Uh, we found it, we, we had to, um, and it was only the 14500. We didn't want, but you know, at some point, you need to do with the camera. Um, but yeah, that, that can take a lot of time, and sometimes you don't have the product, sometimes you don't have the market, sometimes you have neither of those. How many of you feel you are uh, you're not, you, you, how many of you did not find the first market fit in the audience? Can you raise your hand please? Okay, okay. So most of you tonight are looking for over market fits, you are expanding, right? That, uh, can you raise your hand if that's your case? No? Okay, interesting. So almost all of you have their market fit and are just iterating on that one, right? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, maybe at the back you want to, to add something. Yeah, can we have the mic, please? No, thank you. Right, maybe it's also time to, to take a first round of questions. So, if you have any question or remark or anything, just yeah. raise your hand. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think I think product market fit, like in your roadmap and all that jazz, like happens. Like, it's a lot easier once you're a big company or once you just are a company. And you have an actual product. Um, when you're building your product, like when you're super small, so like 15 or even smaller, um, what you build is like really important, right? Because time is like the, the essence, because you only have so many dollars of funding. So, how do you tell me, kind of like walk me through your process for knowing and deciding what features, like what to build? Um, and knowing what markets to go after. Like, you, you have a hunch, we're all humans, so we all have this like, intuitive sense of what could work, but how do you validate it? How, like, what are the steps for you to, to jump in and say, like, we're gonna do this, not this, and why? I think that's like, pretty, pretty important, because you might have a hunch on, on the fit, then you have to test it, you have to test it in a really cheap way, and that's, I think, what makes or breaks the uh, start. So, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Also, that was uh, my next topic, so perfect, perfect transition. So just to recap for everyone, the question is how as a product leader, so product manager, uh, or product CEO, Guillaume, I think Miriam is here as well, so Miriam is working on the product that there as well, how do you uh, prioritize the feature you want to build and test those feature against your assumption for the market fit? Did I? Well, I guess before testing and before developing, well, you start with a hunch, so you start with a vision, which is normal, uh, but then you need, and that's, I think this is the hardest part of being the founder and dealing with the product, it's like you've got that vision, but you need to discuss with potential customers, and you need to do that customer discovery, which is not about finding customer, which is just about asking them questions without trying to have them answer what you want. So there is a specific way of asking the question, which is not easy. And it's not about convincing, neither it's about evangelizing, which is very hard because when you're the founder, <coughs> you spend your whole day doing that and your whole day doing that to investors, trying to convince. But that, you actually need to find yourself and it's not about that. It's, it's really about asking some basic question, listening and doing that 10, 15, 100 times, 200 times, and then, you actually learn a lot about who are your potential targets, what kind of feature resonates into the mind of your potential customers. But again, at the end, probably interview 100 and maybe only 10 of those might be your potential customer tomorrow, or maybe even less. Um, and then you need to do something that is like mind fucking uh, because you need to balance what you hear from that feedback to what was your initial vision and hunch and align that with the global strategy of the company. And one of the issues and the complex part is also you need to drive your company, and so you need to, to drive people. You need to drive your product team, you need to drive your engineers, uh, so they, they, they actually are not going to wait for you to, to end up with a conclusion, to actually start to do something, so you need to drive them and, and to actually have them build something, but also assure them that well, it's going to change, and you need to tell them, and you need to give them enough insight from what you, you've heard. You even maybe probably need to have them, if it's possible, meet some of those potential customers and be part of that customer discovery so they understand themselves firsthand what, what, the, what those people are, are, are talking about. 
but you can't tell them like every day because like one day you feel like well I've nailed it and the next day like no it doesn't work and you can't tell that tell that to, to, to your team every day so that's that's the most complex part um, so obviously you are building things and I think we all have been building things that actually are not used and that you'll need to drop as features or, or whatever but there is no perfect way of doing it and always also when you start you need an idea and I think that's one of the, the complex parts also you need to start and you need to build something sometimes to showcase just discussing and adding nothing like just you could say like I'm going to do the entire customer discovery without starting to develop anything without even starting a company you can you can try to do that but it's not going to be enough anyway so you need to do that customer discovery once you are actually building the product and this is like that balance uh, where obviously the product is going to build is going to, to be thrown out uh, but that's okay and I think if you, if, you, if you see what the most successful company that we're using today how they, they started they all shifted at some point uh, they all understood many different things and I think one of the interesting examples is Twitch like Twitch they spent years with like just in TV like, like you don't even know what, what this thing is and, uh, and, and at some point they figure out, well, this is gaming, and actually gaming can apply what we are learning into the gaming industry, and they actually started to do like a real customer discovery at that point, which they didn't do before, um, and they, they shifted. But it's, it's always the same for every company, so I don't, there is no magic recipe. Um, and but the, the, probably the most magic thing is just looking to potential customers, but not trying to convince them. And honestly, that's the hardest part. Thank you. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more on the fact that there's no like easy answer, otherwise we wouldn't have a job, because you know, it would be too easy. Um, but it makes me think of three things. Um, first one, definitely agree. Uh, talk to your customers, that's like completely obvious, but it needs uh, to be processed in order to be really done. Uh, so if you're a PM, you need to make sure that you spend more than 50% of your time doing research. And that can be talking to clients, that can be looking into data. But I think one of the main issues today in product management is that PMs are project managers in a lot of companies, and they spend 80% of their time reviewing tickets, uh, validating tickets, doing project management. And that's great, but this doesn't leave enough time to do that research that's so important. So. I've spent a lot of time at Airco building processes to make sure that the PM has the time to do that research. And that means empowering the lead developer a lot more, empowering the designer a lot more, and I'm really convinced that if the PM has a good understanding of the problem, someone else will find a solution. And I'm fine it would be a great solution if we were able as a PM team to understand and convey the problem in the right way. So I think that's the first thing. Second thing, data, obviously. Again, uh, that's basic, but for us, we, when we had all of those customers at the beginning that were all doing different stuff, obviously we looked at data for those, uh, so adoption of features for them, but then also the NPS, so the Net Promoter Score. Do you know what it is? Yeah. Um, and so we, of course, look at NPS globally, but we try to segment it as much as possible. So NPS per country, NPS per persona, NPS per product. And this really helped us to see that these guys were happier than these guys. And so it was really obvious we should go for these guys. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing comes a bit after, and I think this really, I mean, if you're a head of product, is the key to your job. I said this already at a Play-Doh meetup, so sorry if you're hearing this twice, but I believe that the most important part of my job was to be the guardian of focus at all times. Specifically in a company that grows like super quickly, everybody gets so excited and wants to go everywhere. The sales team is on fire, they want to sell to everyone, and you are the only person, as a product person, whose, whose interest it is to say, sorry guys, but this is not our market, please don't sell to them, otherwise we're gonna regret that in one year. And I, I made that mistake and I wasn't verbal enough on that point two years ago and we paid for that after. And so after that we created again processes, I really like processes, um, 
to prevent that situation, um, we introduced something that's called the deal desk. And this means that for every new potential deal that's coming in that's a bit less, there's a committee to validate whether or not we will send to them. And we end up sometimes saying, no, we're sorry, you like your product, but we will not say, send it to you because we believe you will be unhappy with it. <coughs> so yeah, talking to your customers, data, and then really like being very, very extreme in maintaining that focus. I couldn't agree more, so I'm uh, not going to add a lot of things here. You have many questions. I'm going to share just two numbers. Um, when I joined Job Teaser, the product management process uh, was designed so that product managers spent about two-thirds of their time doing exploration work, discovery work. Okay, So it's not uh, behind their computers or trying to help the developers and be uh, what I call the backlog nurses to do perfect uh, Jira tickets. It was to go uh, talking to customers, show prototypes, go with the UX, do user research, and so on. So that was the, the first big thing I think we did right. And um, the second thing I think is to be clever with the, the tests you guys are gonna go are gonna do to find the product market fits. And I'm gonna share uh, one of uh, the ones that I found the most clever that was done by the founders of my previous company before they actually started. So they had an idea. Uh, the, the market was the moving market, the, the, the déménagement, and uh, they had this idea of okay, maybe we can help people to switch all their contracts to one place to another for free. So the paperless model was like, okay, you, you will have your internet box, you will have uh, your insurance at home, you will have all the different contracts you need, and uh, we switch them from one place to another for free. You don't have to do anything, and the providers will pay, because they have a lot to gain to retain, uh, retaining customers. In order to test that, so you have to attract the right market and to design a test, they rented their apartment on Le Bon Coin, so we are here in the Bokwa place, so that's uh, pretty uh, interesting. And um, so people came to visit their apartment, so they know that they were moving, okay? And when they came and they entered into the apartment, they just said, actually, we don't rent it, but what we can do is move all your contracts for you right now, if you want. So all you have to do, if you like that for free, is you have to invest 20 minutes of your time to do this form. And if the users like invested 20 minutes of their time, it was enough of a proof to build a company. They did that and they knew a very amazing traction. So it was a very tricky like, trick really to get the first glimpse of will you have a product market fit. And I think a lot of the discovery aspect goes to this kind of test design to have the market coming and a clever test to test it. I think it's a, yeah, very good. Thanks, guys. I mean, uh, you're bringing a lot of great points. I could not agree more with uh, you, Maya, on the project management side. We just hired an engineering project manager at Screen, and it totally changed my life. I went from managing project to talking back to customer more and more. So that's uh, could not agree more on that one. Uh, yeah, we had a question, I think. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so thank you. Um, I had a question about how much time like, do you think it, when do you know it's enough time when you talk with your customers or you get data? Because you can go for a long time, but uh, once is time. And uh, the other one was uh, for a fair, which I, I didn't understand quite clearly how much people you have at the moment. You said these two people in front of them. 11? That would be great. That's 11 and all remote, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. So we're going to just go. So the question, I guess, is how many time do we spend before we are sure enough uh, so we can build the product? <coughs> uh, we have a kind of very arbitrary rule uh, on our side on discovery. We do user tests. So with discovery, the point is to address the biggest risk at first. And most often, you know the problem that is on your market. The biggest risk is, is the, did the solution you design uh, is enough to make people switch to their current habit to the new product. That's what you want to test in a reliable way. So we do a customer's interview where we check, do they have the problems we are trying to solve? Then we show a very high fidelity prototype that is almost looking like a product. And after that, we try to make people invest. So there are very different ways to do that. If you are in B2B, you can say, okay, 
So you're going to buy a subscription, if it's, even if it's just a PowerPoint right now, or a principal design or whatever, so you're going to buy it. If you are in B2C, it could be, uh, okay, so you're going to give us very personal information, and we're going to call you, so you're going to participate in building the product. So you know that people just don't say, you mentioned it at first, you have to be sure people just are not nice and try to say, yeah, it's very good, I would use it. So you have to make them invest. So what we do for B2C is that, okay, so give us very personal information, your phone number, and we're going to call you once a week so you can help us building the product. Kind of. We have also a big form designed in order for people to invest a lot of times, and if they do that, it's cool. And our rule of thumb is that once we have five people that are in the car market and that are interested enough and they do that, that invest, we say it's good and we build it. I think uh, Arthur has a very good point on come with what you want to validate first. Just don't go randomly to people because first you're not going to speak with the right person, not maybe in the right persona. I think at some point we want to talk about persona. Especially Guillaume, we are in the same market and persona matters a lot. And so, yeah, just don't go randomly, go with hypotheses, go with things you want to validate or invalidate. Uh, yeah, I think you use it all. I think I can't answer your question. Uh, I think it's really, it really depends on what project we're talking about. I think we spent about two years doing research on analytics, which is a huge part of our value proposition. Still haven't figured it out. And we don't want to build something that's not relevant. That's, of course, a matter of priority of the topic and how much it hurts your customers. Um, I think for me, the one rule is that I ask the team to never ever start a project before, or even never start specifying a project uh, before they can't answer those questions. Uh, so the first one is, what's the problem we want to solve? Second one is, why do we want to solve it? So why is this a huge priority? For who? And what won't be in scope? Th those four questions, they have to fill it in a document, very much inspired by Intercom, their intermission doc, I don't know if you know it. So they fill out this document, and I review it, and I challenge them a lot on that document. And that's kind of the starting point of the specs box. Other than that, I can't help you, I'm sorry. Well, I agree, I think it depends really on the product, and the complexity of your market, and the, and the personas, uh, as you said. Uh, I think when you're early stage, obviously, well, you want people that are engaged, and that actually are able to pay or not even pay, honestly, at the beginning, it's actually use the product, is probably uh, enough. Uh, um, and so you tend probably also to build feature that you're not going to persist over time, but you need to have enough hunch and more than hunch based on actually your customer discovery field that, okay, if that could potential customer actually is going to use my product if I build that feature, and it seems that that feature kind of resonates a little bit into the mind of, of, of more of them, uh, let's do it. But you're probably going to be, you know, 50, maybe a bit less than 50% of the time at the beginning, building things that you're not going to scale over time and that you're going to have to deal with at some point and probably, obviously, kill the feature and maybe kill the customer. And that's, that's, that's when you actually reach that point. And I think when you reach that point, it's like, it's a very good sign. Yes, hi. I had a question related to SaaS, mostly, <clears throat> about finding the to who. Mm -hmm. um, so how much did you invest in getting some traffic on your product and targeting at least niches so that you could validate that those niches uh, were interested? Or did you go randomly and sort of iterate it? And the second part of my question is, you chose support, but support is wide. So how did you segment, how did you iterate to find the pattern within support that, that was your market and not so much in your support is too huge? Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat maybe the first part? I'm not sure exactly. First part is did you invest in getting some traffic on your product in order to segment and know the sub-segment that was mostly interested in your product? Or uh, did you not? Um, so maybe I'll answer by the second one. Um, so yeah, support is huge, definitely. And actually, it wasn't going for support. It was going for support teams, 20 to 50 people. So that's already very much restricted. Um, 
what, that, that's, that's kind of like the first market that we had, is very small businesses again, but so it was, um, yeah, it was smaller than support, definitely. Uh, and the choice here was to say, we're in a SaaS uh, model, uh, we have a product that can be used by everyone in a company, and so we want to have a land and expand strategy. We want to start with support in a company that's up to 500 people, and then we want to penetrate from the inside the other teams of the company. And so that was the strategy from the ground up, is how to go from these very, very small customers that you can see before, uh, to the second market, that's actually the support, to the third one, that's the sales that we're currently working on. Uh, regarding traffic, um, so we, we, we did that, we did that, and then we worked on onboarding. Uh, so this is also something that I wanted to cover there. Um, so maybe I can transition into the channel thing. Um, so you want to adapt your product to your market, but then you want to consider also the channel and the model. So, yeah, I should go again. Um, so for our first market, it was the very, very small businesses. What they wanted as a product was a phone number ready to use in five minutes. The channel for these guys was actually inbound acquisition. Uh, mostly. So we did not have an army of sales guys doing cold calling at that time and a lot of word of mouth as well. And then the model, because there were pretty small companies, was a monthly subscription, no commitment, pretty low pricing. So what was a big discovery for me was to see how we also needed to adapt our product to the model and the channel and not only to the market. So typically the channel, as I was saying, for this market is inbound acquisition. And so the way we adapted the product to that was to invest a lot on onboarding. We had a ton of customers coming to our product. No one was helping them because they weren't talking to a sales guy. So we needed to take them by the hand and show them how the product worked. We also needed to boost product adoption really, really early because these guys, again, they weren't talking to us by email or by phone, so if we lost them after five minutes, boom, they were gone. We needed to adapt the model uh, to the model as well, and so this meant having a pricing and a payment method that was easy for these guys, typically a credit card. The second market, um, medium businesses, if I can say, so 100 to 500 uh, employees, what they want as a product was a smartphone system with analytics, for example. Uh, so we adapted that product to, to these needs. And then for the channel, it was really different. These guys, the way they work is with outbound marketing, outbound calling. So we have now a very, very big sales team, a lot of SDRs that just spend their day calling and calling people. And we also do a ton of partner events. Uh, CRMs, for example, help us. We have very strong partnerships with Zendesk or Salesforce. And so to adapt to this channel, typically what we did is to uh, build very strong partner integrations because this is how we got these guys. Again, on the model, very different for these guys. Yearly commitments, they paid upfront and they have a very much, they can afford to have a very much higher price point. And so we needed to adapt to that as well. I'm not really sure I answered your question though, did I? Kind of. Kind of. So okay. I think, I think you know, when we start with, the, with SaaS, we also have this feeling, okay, I'm going to go to small digital companies, yeah. when, and they're going to love my product because they will be early adopters. And the truth is there are patterns of behavior, and you can use the testing to do that. So you need to recruit online to see what's coming out of your batch. And my question was more, you know, how long did it take you? How did you, how did you, you know, apply the strategy of iteration to just say, okay, I'm not just, I'm not gonna go out in the world and just target every digital company, uh, you know, startup and see what's gonna fall. Yeah. yeah. How did you just narrow the market, you know, maybe it's countries, maybe it's industries or sub-industries. How do you target, do you have a general, you can have, you can't avoid the ocean. So how are you gonna get that? Um, I think for us, it went down a lot to the websites and the value proposition we emphasized on the websites, which was very clear, uh, phone system for support, and we actually had so many debates about that. Should it be phone system for call centers, for example, because that's, like the sales wanted that because a call center is many users, so they get a higher commission. Um, 
should it be for support, for support and sales, for businesses? And so the whole uh, conclusion of that discussion was, okay, we want to go to support for SMBs, and so we're going to communicate that very clearly on our website. We're going to communicate on intuitive, flexible, simple, and we're not going to communicate on customizable, um, strong uh, support, stuff like that. Does that answer your question, yes. your question now? Okay, cool. <laughs> Something to what you are saying because you are talking about uh, traffic acquisition to actually determine that. Uh, like the product market fit is actually the goal is to find the marketing message and, the, and your target. So before doing like tons of traffic acquisition and probably spending tons of money for nothing and having like a huge number of potential customers that you don't actually know how to handle. Uh, that's why you need to do things that don't scale and without actually investing in marketing. And then once you actually <laughs> know a little bit more about who is your target, then you can do marketing and you can invest into traffic acquisition. Yeah. But if you do it the other way around, it's never going but to I work. Guess, I guess the difficulty at our stage is that we, we can't make the difference between a small sign, you know, a weak signal, and something major. It's difficult to just make a difference on small scale samples. So we try to get some traffic. I'm not talking about you know getting some money into that, but getting some traffic to test messages and all. I think that one part of that uh, that I didn't mention is actually the integrations that are very very core in the value proposition of a lot of SaaS products. And then if you piggyback on another company's growth, you can really choose which company. And so typically for us, going for Salesforce, that's a huge company with very big names or going for Sugar CRM, that's a very um, smaller company in terms of markets, uh, really made the difference. And at first, we started to go for Salesforce, didn't work at all. And so we went back with Intercom, had a big partnership with them, it worked so well. And then Salesforce was big for 2018 when we were bigger, and at this point it worked. I think I, I would uh, plus one on uh, Guillaume because I feel like if you're like coming back to what Arthur said at the very beginning, like take five people and if they could become ambassador of your product, then you can accelerate on that. Just don't like burn money, energy, anything on getting more because that's not what you are looking. You are looking for qualitative and not quantitative. You had a, had a question at the front. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, discovery and user research is really important to get an understanding of where you're at. Uh, it, it will give you the feeling, uh, am I product market fit or not? But is there a way to get the big picture at scale? Like, is there a metric, a KPI? You talked about NPS. Is there something else we could look at? Or not? Well, there is this uh, question I mentioned. At first, um, one of the most accepted definitions is that once you launch even a feature, you can look at product market fit on a very different kind of scales, and you can ask if I remove that product, uh, would 40% of people declare that they are very disappointed into losing it? So that's one way of seeing a product market fit that is a quantity. There are a lot of different uh, ways uh, to do it. Of course, it's different uh, when you have a B2B one. On B2B, my favorite one, which is very straightforward, it's to add per segment. So when I look at product market fit, the market means a segment. If on my segment I have five strong ambassadors that are pitching the product to their peers, I have a product market fit, and uh, that's it. So that's kind of my two approaches, but there are many, many ways, I think, to do it. Yeah, just one metric that's pretty straightforward in B2B, and it's as true. Uh, and you've got pretty standard uh, rates of churn, so how many customers actually leave your product and cancel their subscription. Uh, so if people leave, obviously you're not answering their needs. I don't know. Retention maybe? Usage? Yeah, I would say recurring usage and feature adoption in general. Um, I think feature adoption is as important in B2C than in B2B, uh, but uh, it's more straightforward in B2C. So I would say that recurring usage. Yeah, but you need to be careful about something. You can have a product market fit, but not in the right product. So you can have a small product market fit, but you could have like amazing uh, retention, amazing usage, but only 100 customers. So means you're not attacking the right market. And that's something that is not that easy to find. Uh, because, well, 
you probably not, uh, 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 well, either of your product is not meant for a bigger market, but that's the question, is, is it a good market? And, uh, a big uh, enough market. And, and a big enough market, exactly. Uh, where is the ceiling? And, uh, and that's, well, if I relate to my previous experience, so we, we, we started as B2C, we actually had amazing numbers, and at some point, well, we, we basically hit the roof, and like, how do we grow even more? How do we pass like 10,000 uh, subscribers? Well, we can't. Okay, we're going to pour tons of money into AdWords. Let's do it. Well, sadly, it doesn't work. Uh, so what do we do? And basically, you understand that actually the market is structured a little bit differently than what you expected, and that the size of the market is not that big, in, but, but your product is good, so change the market. And it comes back to a very interesting point is that product market fit is not only about usage, it's also about rentability. So you have to find a product market fit that you can finance. So it encompasses also that because you can be on a very, very big market, uh, being in the music industry, for example, and you, have, you don't have any ways to make it like a, pro a profitable business. So it, all, it also encompasses that notion. So it's a very wide thing, but uh, it's not only usage. So that's uh, one of the tricky part too. Jump on that. Uh, when I worked at BlaBlaCar, we launched a um, bunch of new markets, um, and there was definitely a market. There was traction right from the beginning in terms of usage, but then once we decided to monetize the the product, suddenly everyone left. Uh, so we had a product market fit for a free product, uh, but we, we didn't have one for a paid product. So we iterated on that to find it, and it turns out the product was not the right one. For these guys. Um, so yeah, of course it comes down to money. We are almost 40, 40, 45 minutes. You get to feel okay? Yeah. You are ready to continue? Cool. Uh, I want to open up the, the next discussion. So either we keep digging into the topic, the finding the market fit, or we shift more into what it takes to be a PM or a founder, CEO of Guillaume. Uh, building product like that, what it means to push back customer, kill feature, keep consistency, keep your team aligned and motivated. Uh, because as Guillaume said earlier, you can ask your team to change focus every quarter, every week, every month uh, to, to go after another market fit. So who's in to keep digging into finding the market fit? Rise or end? Don't be shy. Who's in more uh, being a PM? We have a tie. Yeah, but uh, uh, what do you feel uh, in the mood for, guys? At the end of the day, you are the one uh, sharing. Just the time, sure. <laughs> All right, we can do that. Your, so let's maybe close up on that one and, uh, and next move on. Um, you had a very interesting topic, Maya, uh, um, on that. The, the pushing back, uh, I think it's still in the market fit. Uh, you mentioned it earlier with the sales team. But can you share stories, experiences on what really it takes to say no to a customer? I think that's a big, big, uh, bold move, sometimes brutal. You don't want to do it, but you have to. So first, it takes time uh, to, to get to that point in the company where it's actually acceptable to do that. And it's still painful to do it. Um, it all comes down to being aligned as a leadership team on that first market. If you're not aligned there, of course no one will follow you in those decisions. Um, so to do that, we do it uh, yearly. Uh, at Airco, we used to do it yearly. Um, so every year in December, we all flew to the New York office to talk about that and a bunch of stuff. Um, and then that very strong uh, strategic goal that we have for the next year, I just repeat it so much throughout the entire year uh, to pretty much everyone. And um, a friend of mine, Maxime Krad, who's at Facebook now, uh, once told me that a good test for that is if you're in the toilets with someone, if you ask them, okay, what are the three product goals of this year? If they can answer, it means you're doing a good job there. Um, so yeah, ticks and tricks, uh, tricks make it fun, make it catchy. Uh, we had three goals, three verbs, easy to remember. Um, so yeah, I would say that's the, the first thing is really over and over communicate about that. Um, and then in terms of processes, well, we, we had that, uh, that deal desk that I mentioned. We also had 
a really clear ICP, ideal customer profile uh, slide that I presented to every newcomer in the company, so I presented that once a month. Um, the interesting part about that slide is not the customers you want to go after, it's the customers you don't want to go after, and we made that super clear uh, to, to everyone that joined. Um, and then maybe one last anecdote is that when we went at the very beginning from that a customer base of very, very small customers to a bit, bit better, bigger, sorry, companies, we actually decided to go for a pretty radical move, which was to get rid of a lot of the small ones, uh, which is complicated because they used us a lot, like 30 times a day for some. Uh, they paid for our service, uh, but we just analyzed that financially these guys were no longer uh, profitable for us. We were spending a lot of time educating them around the product and the necessities to, to use Airco. And we made that move. It was, it was super hard. Uh, we just emailed everyone that uh, our price was coming from 10 to 30 uh, per month, and that we had now a minimum of three users to use Airco. So that was almost, uh, that was multiplied by nine for some people, the price point, which is pretty much impossible to do. Um, and it was a very tough time. We got a lot of complaints, but it was the best decision I think we made in those three years. Um, really helped us to start again, start fresh. Uh, we saw right, right away that NPS was going better because these guys were simply not happy for us and not the right fit for us anymore. I think that's a question. Yeah. Just talking about the NPS, I was just wondering, so we are using Bing and we have a case where a customer just closed the windows and it gives us a zero as a rank. And when we ask them why did you put zero, they're just uh, answering, oh sorry, we just want to close the window. So did you have this case and how do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, a bit there than that. Uh, okay. If you don't have stories, I have stories. Oh, I think you can just change your NPS provider. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfied, they're good. Yeah, just a fun story from this week. So we are using Delighted, uh, which is a simple SaaS to add an NPS, very well done, very simple. And we had this guy, very long, all time customer, almost with us for, from the beginning, and he ranked us zero. That's brutal. Like, I was like, no, there's no way he push, put to zero for us. And so I started to look at the, the analytics, uh, chase him out on LinkedIn. We uh, look at everything he did, and we have this tool called Full Story. Uh, it's like Ajar, it's screen recording. And so I, I found that session when he voted zero. And so you can see the guy, what he was actually trying to do. He was trying to get into a menu which was hidden by the NPS bar. And so he was looking around, he was like, fuck, I want to get rid of that thing. Click zero, dismiss it, and was just looking after the menu. So I still don't, I don't have the final word, but. Uh, uh, full story was a uh, helpful on <laughs> Just a uh, Yeah? How frequently uh, should we measure the NPS? Do we have to wait for releases? My answer would be real time. But, uh, yeah. yeah, we were really big on NPS at Airco. Uh, we even had lights in the office that every time there was an answer, we turned like red if it was a bad one, green if it was a good one. That's cool. Uh, we, we had an NPS channel on Slack, the, old, the entire company was on it, people were commenting on the, on the comments of the customers. Um, and then it was, I mean in terms of rituals, it was, um, it was said and followed every week at the weekly all hands call. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't get the question. We sent it every three months in order not to be too intrusive, yeah. Uh, to the customers, but we internally followed everything. So, another fun story on that one. We had a bug where we went sending it almost after a sign up. And so, you start, you have this bar showing up, and we have this guy who says, Shut up. <laughs> Why does this guy say, Shut up? And again, finding the recording. The guy was on the onboarding screen, and he was like, It's too early, guys, to ask me something, go away. So, yeah, don't make that mistake early. That's well. <laughs> Plenty of story around in these days. One very, very basic trick is that uh, send it by email, also because in the product they are focused on doing a task, so you interrupt them. If you send emails, it's very reliable sometimes. Very simple, a bit more old-fashioned, but it works.
Hey, um, I've got a question regarding the product research. Uh, I totally agree with you guys on the, the its importance. Um, my question is, uh, who do you think should do it? Do you think you need all the products doing it uh, on the project or feature they're going to work on? Um, on my side, our vision has uh, evolved a bit on this. At first, it was only the PMs that were doing the discovery part. And we found that uh, there could be a big leverage into having also the development teams sometimes uh, participating uh, in the product. So it's much more important right now, I give a bit of context, but we switched to OKRs, basically, so we have not, no, uh, not anymore roadmaps with a bucket list of features. Teams commit on a metric, that's it, and they find the right solution to reach that metric. Okay? So it brings back a lot of ownership on the team. So there are a lot of debates on what should we do as a team. There are their team of entrepreneurs, that's how we define squat. And uh, there is a triptych with a UX guy, a PM guy, and a lead engineer. And those three have to be implied in the discovery work all the time. So they go to customers' meetings. Sometimes they fly out even to European countries to do so. But it's much, much, much more powerful when you have those three guys convinced than just the PM that is trying to evangelize. So we are moved from PMs to a lot of guys, even sometimes all the squad. Um, I agree, we, we try to make as many people do it as possible. So the product and engineering team uh, all have to do at least one customer physical visit a month. Um, everyone does support as well, pretty standard. And then the leadership team, we also all had uh, sponsorships of certain accounts, so we had to do calls with them. Uh, but then, of course, the PMs and the designers uh, spent a lot more time uh, visiting and calling customers than the rest of the company. Um, I think one other in uh, interesting part that we kind of missed or we were, we were really late on it is product marketing, having a product marketing function. Um, the way I see it is really more on the American uh, vision of it, which is that this is a function that's in charge of analyzing a market, market dynamics, a competitive landscape, and trends in a market or in an industry. And so we actually just hired, uh, two months ago, our head of product marketing. And I mean, I wish she arrived before, uh, because this is just something that's a full-time job. Uh, so we, as a, like the PM team, used to do it. Uh, but I think it's really important to have that function a bit earlier than us. That's the, that's the question actually I wanted to ask you about the product marketing because the job that you mentioned as a, as a, as a product person that evolved from like the project manager to someone thinking more about research and even marketing actually resonated as like a product marketing person, which is a kind of a new job role that we discover in Europe that has been around for kind of a lot of time in the US. Um, and today, what we are encouraged to do by our investors, and I think you can relate to that also, I know, obviously, is to actually hire product marketing very, very, very soon. Um, and that person actually helps you in your customer discovery and your customer research right away. Uh, and the way to define a product marketing person, I think, well. Any different companies? Yeah. Different I ask. Like the background is not so much, but the background of that person? Yeah, that's like the, the ship with five feet, basically, that you are looking for. Um, but that person is, is, is so important, and honestly, right away, and to also your, your question at the beginning, uh, it depends the stage of your company, so who is actually in charge of discussing with customer. Uh, I think we should make sure that you never forget to have C-level still doing that. And when the company grow bigger and bigger and bigger, sometimes like the, the responsibility is like probably more like on the on the sales and the, the product team. You always need to have leadership there because if you don't have the leadership, well, the leadership actually lose track of the ground and what exactly happening. And this is how you end up usually in a very complex situation, even in terms of product. And this is the same uh, with sales and like when to say yes or no to a customer. Um, at Skillsoft, when we had like we have three thousand employees, uh, that was a software company that turned out to be a sales company. That was a fucking nightmare. Uh, I've never seen that before. Uh, we made like seven hundred million dollars of revenue, so pretty amazing. Uh, but the product was—I I don't think like anyone actually knew exactly what the product was doing anymore because sales people were selling everything they could, and the issue is like 
at the leadership of the company, they, they were most, mostly salespeople also, and they completely lost track of the product and the fact that in the software industry, you're in an offer market, you're not in the demand market, you make the market, you make the offer. You're not, so you need to listen to your customer, obviously, because if you don't do it, well, you're probably pretty stupid and you're not going to go that far, but listening doesn't mean saying yes, and when you lose every leadership around that and the only goal is actually to make that revenue target and cross that target, your salespeople, and, and that's also different between Europe and the US, but in the US, I think well, they are way better at sales than we are here, but also that means that they can, they can actually get nuts about that and forget everything. Uh, just hitting the, the revenue target. So it could be nice for the first year, the next year, but five years ahead, you end up with a nightmare uh, to manage. And, and this is usually when the product team, well, for us, the product team completely fell at their job. But why? Because they didn't have the support of their leadership. That's also the, the thing. So keep having leadership involved in all those questions. That's, that's key. And just, just to balance on that, because uh, that relates to product marketing, we design the job as to prevent this. So they train the sales team in order to control kind of the way we sell, and if it doesn't work, the way we iterate. So our product marketing role is much more down, down the funnel than you may have, so it's a choice. Sometimes there is a bit of conflict here, they want to be at uh, the top of funnel. On our side, they are doing the go-to-market strategy, they are doing the, the pricing on their side, and they are doing the internal training to make sure that we sell stuff the right way and we iterate the right way. They're actually doing it too. <laughs> like they're, they're doing both, I hope. Um, but I, to, to jump back on what you were saying, isn't that the job of a product marketer understanding the market? The way I see it is that the product marketer is in charge of having insights on an industry. So this is very broad. Um, so, for example, for us, okay, we want to penetrate the sales, SMB market in France, whatever. The PM, the product manager, will do some research and then come back and say, well, we need mobile, uh, we need to lower the cost of our outbound pricing, or whatever. But then the product marketer will say, there is something big going on in the phone industry about AI, uh, artificial intelligence. So maybe you guys in the product team should start and look into that because like everyone's starting to acquire AI companies and nothing's going out yet but there's something going on, maybe you should look into it. So it's like a very much broader insight. Then the product marketing is never going to say, I believe that this segment of customer needs us to improve that feature, for example. Hi and thank you for for your answer. Um, I have a question about PMs and uh, the fact that they, they don't have power over the designers, they don't have power over the salespeople, they don't have any power nearly at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel a lot of pain here. <laughs> uh, I want to know how, uh, as a VP or as a head of a product, how do you manage the relationship with head of engineering, head of uh, sales, head of marketing uh, uh, to favor the product managers to like uh, uh, do better job or something like that? How your insight about that? Um, so it's funny the, the, the way you ask that question because I think that for me, I don't see a lot of power in my role, I mean, I, I, I describe it as kind of like being Switzerland, so there's a lot of, you know, like different opinions, obviously customer support always disagrees with sales, and then, you know, everyone disagrees, and so I'm in charge of making sure that I have all opinions, and then making a recommendation, so it's not completely Switzerland, of course, because I make a recommendation and we go for it, uh, but, I don't think that there is like a voice of product. Uh, there's a voice for the vision, which should be shared by everyone, uh, and established by the product, talking to everyone. Um, to answer your question more specifically, I really encourage the teams to uh, themselves have strong relationships with salespeople, support people, etc. 
One thing we did, a uh, concrete thing, is that we introduced a new role. So we have squads, pretty standard, uh, five developers, a PM, a designer, uh, just like everyone else. But then we added one role to this squad, which is the biz in squad, biz for business. And that's a person from the business team, so it can be a sales guy, it can be a support guy, marketing guy. And this person has to be in the squad half a day per week. And so what they do is that they're here for all the project kickoffs. They're in charge of communicating everything that's being done to the rest of the business teams during their business meetings. And then coming back with feedback, basically. And so that role really helped in bridging that gap before uh, between tech and product in one hand and then business on the other hand. Um, on our side, the one thing that really is a lot of tension and that I think will help a lot of PMs uh, to kind of have the power, <laughs> if I uh, take your, your pain right now, uh, was to move uh, to OKRs and to change the way we commit. So we do not commit on this thing that had a lot of tension that everyone wants to participate in, that everyone wants to put stuff in, which is a roadmap. So we just say our product managers are entrepreneurs, we are investors, okay? So we give them resources, UX, engineering, uh, research, market, and so on. And then we commit on the metrics and we have board meetings when we review their OKRs, but what solution will they choose? It's their own problem. It's not ours to define roadmap. I think that maybe it's, uh, there are a lot of ways to do it, but that maybe it's the most pregnant and most efficient uh, ways we, we did it to empower the teams and in particular the teams. What they usually said, they mostly for the product and engineering, which usually spend most of their lives together. Like if you're VP of engineering and you're VP of product or you're head of whatever, they don't play nice together, you need to fire at least one of them, if not both. Uh, because honestly, if that relationship doesn't work, nothing is going to work. Um, and it's difficult, but that relationship needs absolutely to work. And usually you see companies uh, that are successful is that when that relationship is working well. Um, and because that relationship can bring like tons of tensions, obviously. And, and there is like, it's, it's like, it's, a, it's about people at the end of the day. And, uh, but that, that specific one is, is so important. Um, and obviously at the beginning, but I think at every level of the, of the spectrum of the size of your company, uh, you need that relationship to work very well. Maybe Guillaume, uh, since you wear multiple hats at your stage, you are the salesperson, you are the product person, you are... Uh, you are so you don't do anything at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but how do you keep that uh, energy going on in the team, this alignment? Like, I think at our stage, uh, the screen stage, the bearer stage, we, it's very intense draining yeah. because you are changing focus a lot of time. Maybe you are killing the product you were building three months ago and you are building a new one. How do you manage that, uh, that energy, that alignment? You need the right people. You need, you, you need to have them that they know why they signed for it. And, and again, it's about people at that side at the beginning. It's just about people who are you going to hire. And the first people are not always and even usually the best one at the end and the other one works also and that's something important to keep in mind um, so carefully choose to be who you're going to work that they understand that it's going to be complex but going to require a lot of passion a lot of patience also a lot of dedication uh, sometimes they are going to have to although you said that in english but uh, uh, <laughs> say the opposite of what you were seeing before, or something like that, like, uh, like uh, go away against your, uh, go away from your own religion, or it, 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 yeah, exactly. Um, and and yeah, honestly, it's 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 about it's about that, and they need to feel the energy. They need, well, they need to be led, obviously, and and that's that's your role as a as a founder, uh, obviously. Um, but yeah, people. Really. Can agree more. Guys, uh, we are reaching the end. I think uh, please a big round of applause for the three of them. Thanks a lot. There is uh, something very special for me. Uh, so when I had a call with the, those three persons, I had them, okay, how do I make this meetup a win? Uh, because I can only ask them to come tonight, spend time with us together, and just go away without anything. That's not the way I see things. 
sorry, we. So, and so each one of them has something we would like to achieve with you tonight. Uh, so maybe Guillaume, you want to start? So I'm going to apply what I told you, customer research. So what we are looking for is actually uh, product uh, people, and we are in the right place to actually discuss with us about their integration strategy and how they see their product involved with integration, either because their product needs to be integrated, they're mostly an API provider or something, maybe an API first product, or because they feel that their product is going to gain a lot of feature by actually adding integration. And so we're really keen to, to just discuss with those person to understand how you organize, to share your challenges, your pain, uh, how you see the future, and just to discuss basically, and to listen. Also, Guillaume will stay around. Miriam is here as well. Maybe overbearers tonight? Yes. Yes, overbearers. So you'll find bearers everywhere. Very cool. I can talk uh, with you about that. Um, so I wanted to tell you guys about what I'm doing next. I wasn't so sure about the answer to that question. I have two. Um, so one of the main pains for me in the past three years was to hire product managers, just like everyone that's leading a product team in Paris today. Um, and so I decided to build a school for PM, so for product managers, to create and train more product managers in Paris. So if that's something that's interesting for you or you want to share something with me about that, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards. But then I'm also going on vacation for the three next months to take a break. So if you have ideas of destinations in South America, <laughs> let me know as well. South America, so if you have a... So I might say they're not going to be original. Uh, we are opening a very strategic position in product. And as you heard, we give a lot of ownerships to our product guys. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so Some people, you say? Yeah. Some people are in pain. Yeah, <laughs> I feel the pain, so we're gonna talk. So yeah, we are gonna open like uh, positions that are mixing management and product that are called group product managers, and we are also opening very senior positions on the product side. So if you know uh, very very talented people, it's all about the people. Yeah. They said, you, let's have a talk. Yeah, I've seen uh, just on that word. I've seen a data play at Amplitude. Uh, Amplitude is an analytic product like uh, Hip Analytics, Mixpanel. They have that function, so if you're interested, you learn more. Cool. Uh, Thomas, I think you have a teasing for next month? Yeah, I just, but before we should give Arnaud a big round of applause. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah, bravo. Maybe you stole my line, but I was about to say the same. Um, we actually touched the product marketing uh, managing uh, topics right now. It was not scripted, no, by the way. It was not scripted, but actually it's a good transition. It's uh, not well set up for next month, but I will be tackling these topics because I uh, like just joined a company, Hermeo. I will talk to you more about it if you're interested. As a product marketing manager, I was a CMO uh, before, and I'm quite curious to, to know more about this topic, which is kind of like new in the Parisian or uh, in the France uh, uh, scene. So if you guys are interested, we will uh, give you more information on uh, all our uh, channels, like on Twitter, on Media, on Everbright, Meetup, and so on. So uh, please keep in touch. And again, I think we can give like a huge round of applause for our speakers tonight. They were just awesome. Just to close this uh, interesting, like deeply interesting meetup, uh, we just want to say that uh, Product Stories is actually uh, on our own product, like we launched with Arno and, and Laure, and we are uh, like hoping you will give us a lot of feedbacks because we want to improve like for months, uh, months over months, our product uh, quality. So any feedbacks are more than welcome. So don't hesitate to ping us on any like social media we are in, and uh, we will try to improve it for, for March. Thanks. And, uh, like any customer discovery, I will chase you. I will get that feedback. I will get that PS. <laughs> Trust me, I will get it. I'm joking. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. And a big, uh, big applause for Vitalacin, of course. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, David. Because, uh, a pleasure to be here tonight. Have fun.